Welcome to Racing Roots with Ham. If you don't know our host, David Ham, he's a 25-year NASCAR veteran, engine builder, and jackman. Live every Monday evening, we have a new guest from the racing world with their stories, their paths, their their racing racing roots. roots. Sponsored by Jersey Cape Yachts. Now here's our host, David Ham. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Racing Roots with Ham right here on 550 and 92.9 WAME Radio and on DHAM I Am on YouTube. So if y'all are tuning in, y'all want to see us here live in the Randy Marion studio, go on to the DHAM I Am YouTube channel and you'll see Racing Roots with Ham. And tonight's guest is Will Con- Cronkright. Sorry, I... <laughs> I you knew, did good. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Everybody keeps asking me, is he kin to Walter Cronkite? I said, no, it's spelled completely different. Or it's spelled different with a K and an R in the middle of the name. Mine's C-R-O-N-K-R-I-T-E, and his is just C-R-O-N-K-I-T-E. And yeah. I just tell folks we run him out of the family for being a black sheep. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> there you go. He wouldn't and, want to mount to nothing. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. And I got Phil Cavalli in here. It's always photo Phil. It's, if you don't know Phil, he's a NASCAR photographer. Well, he didn't work for NASCAR, but he's taken many, many pictures over the years. That I'll, was the office. At yes. The time, yeah. So how many years? Probably 30. 33. And 33. Still, still possible. Might get a couple races in this year. There you go. Good for you. Good deal. A lot of them were uh, Dale Earnhardt Sr., of course. And we're going to talk about Dale Earnhardt Sr. tonight. Mm-hmm. And uh, i got my wife Tracy here to my right, just hanging out with us and answering your questions. And then we got Philip over here. Philip, I don't know your last name though, sorry. And uh, but he he's hanging out with us tonight. He's wanting to get into some media broadcasting and stuff. So So this is the Phil and yeah. Philip section. That's right, yes. Yeah. Phil and Philip yeah. over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to adjust that camera on to Phil it too some, yeah, at some well, point. Hey, just yeah, just turn it and so you can see him for a second here. I'm trying to get your bell That's fine. the bell in here. Yeah, we got the old bell. That'll come up here in a little bit. That'll be for our infamous questions. The question of the night <laughs> kind of thing. Break. We'll do it after a break so we don't <laughs> fly, things fly all over. Yeah, that's right. So, yes, Will, Will Cronkright, and uh, so excited to, to have you here. And I was a little worried when you called earlier because you were stuck in traffic on 77, which we can pretty much always expect that happens, especially 77. But you add rain in there and a storm, yeah. and it's just going to be a bad deal. It was really nasty mm-hmm. Big storm on the southeast, through. southwest side of Charlotte. It raining really bad. And- yeah. Bumper to bumper traffic. So, what time did you leave to get up here? Four thirty. Four thirty. Okay. <laughs> I was wanting to get a good jump. <laughs> yeah. Well, you but did good. Turned out good. Yeah. Sacrificed a lot to come up here on racing routes with him. So, I think you'll have a good time, and it'll be worth the trip. And I think we're going to enjoy it too, because I've already talked to you a little bit, and I watched a couple of videos that had you in it. You know, from other interviews that you were in, and you just had a fascinating life. You got into racing about a year before I was born. Or you got into the NASCAR <laughs> side of it, you know, which I feel like I've been around it since the mid-70s because that's about as far back as I can remember. And so, Phil, do you remember your first NASCAR experience? Well, as far as when I really began to like it, it was probably in the late 60s. My neighbor was probably five yeah. years older than me, John Avery, and he yeah. watched, we'd catch that two-minute blurb on TV, you know. There you go. Yeah, because yeah. back then they didn't show they, – if it was already pre-recorded and that type of thing. So mm-hmm. – but tell us about your story, because you you're not from around here. Can you tell? Yeah. yeah I mean. <laughs> it, it's interesting. When I go home, they really rag me bad about having a southern accent. And down here, I've yeah. been down here since 1970, and I'm still, a I Yankee. guess, sound like well, I'm a, you're a, damn I'm Yankee. a Yankee. Me yeah. too, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm certain I'm a damn Yankee. Well, too. he sounds more northern than you, I think. Right. Well, he's probably been here longer. <laughs> I came here in 93. Well, I left upstate New York in 78. Yeah, I, I came down about, oh, oh Daytona, 1972. Okay, yeah. Mm. So. Yep. So, but we're going to get into some fascinating stories, and some of them are about the Stroker Ace times and, and Dale Earnhardt, of course, as I mentioned, and all the different drivers that you work for. But, yeah, let's just start from the beginning. You know, this is your racing route, your path, your story, your racing routes or routes, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> So well, go for it. I'm almost 80 years old, so for 65 of those years, I've been involved in some kind of wheels, building stuff. I have a propensity to design and create. Um, I'm, I think I would have a reputation as a prolific uh, rule bender. Is that the word you can yeah. use? <laughs> yeah, rule bender. Um, but I just have always been interested in stuff. I started out with go-karts. Uh, got into sports cars. I had a motorcycle that had a uh, 
250 cc tdy 1a yamaha motorcycle engine on it, it was uh. two five gallon tanks on each side no bladders <laughs> Wow. Ig- ignorant stuff. <laughs> yeah. Did you, ra- I guess, race that, right? I, I. So you must have. Was that much power? Did, did, and... uh, did well with it. Yeah. There, I actually had the track record at Mid Ohio, the track record, not the, not the record for go karts, the track record. Wow. <laughs> okay. Along with a dent in the fence about three feet off the ground at the end of that straightaway. Yeah. My legacies at Mid Ohio. Were you wearing a helmet? At the start. Okay. At <laughs> the start. <laughs> I, I know I see you with that Goodyear hat on every time I've seen you in pictures and things. It seems like you're wearing that hat. I have one like that somewhere. I got on good terms with a, with Phil Homer and a gentleman at Goodyear's, and they used to give me hats by the case. Hmm. I don't know why, but I always I always wore a Goodyear hat, all oh. my pictures. and Yeah. Oh, so I've saved this one. This is the best one. And okay. <laughs> Best those, you like know it. those Goodyear hats were known to have a little bit more of that trucker brim to it than the normal hat. The, the ones with the white top are the ones that are the hardest ones for me to hmm. find. That's what Goodyear gave us was well, just like what I'm wearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got I did some photography at I want to say it was Goodyear's 1,000th Cup win, and Carol Schwartz. Well, Goodyear had approached me and wanted to know if she can get a shot from Victory Lane. I said, okay, I just want to keep the hat that's used. And I think it was Jeff Good Gordon you. that won it. Good for and you. I've got that, and it's embroidered on the side, you know, the 1,000th wow. win. So. Were you at Charlotte in 78 when Dale got his start? No. No, I didn't start till 88. All right, so what, so what led you up to that? Because we're going to talk about that um, Dale Earnhardt's ride and how that happened and uh, with, the, with the whole uh, – was it really Willie T. Rib? that whole story and all that, but how did you get into, first of all, how did you get down here? What brought you down to the South? Um, I guess the place to start, I, I had to write about this in a book, but I, in right before Christmas in 1969, I lost my wife and two little girls in a car wreck and I just wanted to be someplace else. You know, sure. I just, I just wanted to be somewhere else. And we just bought a new piece of property, so I was living out there and just looking at the racing books, and I called somebody, and I got a hold of a gentleman named Howard Milliken at, uh, um, uh, where's Earnhardt, where's uh, Jeff Gordon live? Brown Brownville, Indiana, or what's the name of that town? Jeff Gordon's town. Yeah. He lived over there, and he had, a, he had two Indy cars, and I went to work for him. I was over there from April to May. And I worked Indy 1970. Um, and then I ended up working at uh, Ray Nichols in Griffith, Indiana, and met a gentleman there named Ron Purrier, who had built motors for A.J. Foyt. And he and the current motor builders at Nichols Engineering were not seeing eye to eye on how to put together the heads, and he wanted to quit and go to work for Benny Parsons, and he wanted to know if I wanted to go south with him. Okay. To and, LRB. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. And I, I loaded up my sports car that I had been building. The lake where we lived was frozen over three inches of snow. And when I went to LRB, it was sand for miles and 60 degrees or something. Yeah. Haven't gone back. I don't miss the snow at all. So I worked for Benny. I think that would have been 72. And then Joe Frazone and then Cecil Gordon. And then I went to work for Die Garden. Okay. And then something happened with, uh, was it Joe Frazone that had the wreck? That had the, uh, if you tell that story, it, Talladega, and they started it, like. It was the worst wreck they've ever had at Talladega. That would have been in 72, I suspect. They started, if I recall, 68 cars. And on the ninth lap, um, I think Ramos Stott, Stott lost the motor, spun down in the infield. There was no grass, stirred up a storm of dust. And there were people that actually went around the track again. They went around Talladega another lap and crashed into Joe. Oh, wow. Okay. And when he called, he, I called him on the radio, say, you know, are you okay? And he said that effing somebody, and he mentioned somebody's name, just hit me in the door. Hmm. And he did. It hurt him. It hurt Joe really bad. He came in, and it, as is common, you take the windshield out, turn him loose, go a lap, and come back in, put the windshield in. 
And we get we came in, we took the windshield out, but when he left, it, I looked down in the windshield, I was doing the driver's side, and he took off, and I called him on the radio, I said, Joe, I said, what, what, what uniform have you got? And he said, I have the, the Union 76 one, one I always wear. I, I said, well, how come it's red? And he didn't say nothing. So he comes in, and he, he's asking us to put the windshield in. I look down in there, and I can see about six inches of this bone in his forearm. So wow. I'm, I'm saying, Joe, I'm, I'm not inclined to put that windshield back in there. Yes. He says, well, you work for me. If you don't put that windshield in there, I'm going to come out and kick your butt. I'm thinking, yeah. You know, he's got a broke arm. Or he's got his <laughs> arms bleeding. He's over uniform. Yeah. He ain't going to hurt me too bad. That's right. But he started out of the car. So I raised the hood and went around and grabbed a hold of the coil wire, which I regretted at, at yeah, that time. Sure. <laughs> um, but then he did. He came out, and he was going to whip my butt. Wow. So I ran to the, to the infield care center, and he passed out. On the way over there. Yeah. So you mm. saved his life, most likely. Well, yeah. Saved my life was what yeah, I was kind of worried yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> He's, he, Joe was very good to me. He has an erratic reputation, um, I guess the worst of which is the Jack Handle incident. At, I think it was at Charlotte. Okay. It beat the heck out of a Pontiac hood. Oh. But all the time I worked for him, we worked on a, uh, I don't want to say a budget, I had a little stash in the bank and when i i'd use it i'd keep track of the receipts take it to him and give it to him on race day every wednesday there'd be a check in the mail he and he just yeah everybody that i've worked with in racing has been very good to me and he include that included joe for zone but that was a bad wreck they don't do that anymore yeah i know that sounds that sounds pretty bad was that the end of his driving or no okay no he he was he was tough mm -hmm. all right so then what did you do from that, from that point? Um, I, I ended up going to work for Cecil Gordon. And that's where I, um, I hired Mike Hill. Okay, yes. I, I've had some pretty good he's, fellas come to work for me. That's cool. Mike, gotta, Mike was one of them. He's a, he's a, okay. He was a good one, one of the better ones. And um, a guy named, uh, oh, he worked for Junior, Gordon Gibbs, okay. who's, who's since passed away. He yeah. got his start working for me, and a guy named Ron Reedy was working for me. He 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 just retired from working for Hendrix, but how he went to work for me? I had built his dad's first race car up in Dayton, Ohio, and then at my White Crown Engineering shop, I was doing a lot of work for Bill Elliott, outside work, you know, fixing his crash cars when he was earning that million dollars. Yeah, anything I could fix, he could sell. He just I just was working hard for Bill. And we had this car done and ready to be painted, and my painter didn't come into work. He came in two days later, and I said, where were you? And he just looked at me. It was hunting season. Nobody works on the first day of hunting season. And mm. we, we parted ways. But, so I was left trying to get this Bill Elliott car painted. I called this young this guy I worked for in Dayton. He couldn't come down, but he flew his boy down. And Ron Reedy, I'd pick him up. Friday afternoon, about 3 o'clock at the airport in Charlotte, we'd work till Monday morning at 9 o'clock without sleep, just us two painting those cars. That boy was a talented body man and painter. And he ended up being responsible for hanging the bodies and building the frames at Hendrix for all four hmm. teams. So he was a pretty bright kid. But. So I was going to try to get that picture up there of, of Mike Hill. And so let's see if I get it faded over here. All right, so... Oh, I was going to, and we can do this here in a little bit, but I want to show, I want you, I'm going to show the pictures and then have you go through and tell about them. Okay, there's one. And if I can fade it over. Yeah, for some reason, let's see, I'll just play them. That, that's one of only two pictures that I have of Dale and I. I'd love to find some more of mm -hmm. them. But uh, we were sitting on Pitt Road on Charlotte, and the other one is standing by the car, uh, prior to the start of the race in 78. And it, what's interesting was two years ago, the number 90, current number 96 car, Gaunt Brothers Racing, Marty Gaunt, painted their NASCAR car like my 96 with those offset nine and six numbers. And Jeffrey Earnhardt was the driver, Dale's grandson. Yeah. And we spent some time replicating these 
two pictures with Jeffrey that that I had from with Dale. Okay. Those folks treated me good. All right. That's a good year hat. Sir? Yeah, that no. good oh, yeah. year hat. You're sporting the good year hat. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna have to to get it. Um I'm going to work on this just a little bit more because for whatever reason, it's not, it's not wanting to show the pictures that's on one side of the screen. I'm trying to get it to move over and it's not wanting to. So I will uh, work on that. Yeah. It's, it's Dale and my skinny cousin. Oh, well, there, <laughs> oh well, I got it working. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, then there's a, there's a story in my book about five minutes earlier yeah. than that. Was that when it blew up or not? Okay. It was. Okay. <laughs> but there's a penny involved in the book that's called the magic penny or something okay so we'll have to get the book and we'll have to tell everyone how they can get that and it's in the description of this video the link to go and get that book but as the pictures scroll through the you can 31? see is that a 31 um, sir 31 pickup yes it was uh, december 31 that particular pickup was built seven days before they shut down the yeah. assembly line wow well, yeah and there's humpy whaler and ricky rudd there's you on pit wall with that Goodyear hat yeah. somewhere. My barber was on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, back but in the you 70s. had that yeah. Mark Martin badass mustache back in That's the Mark 70s. Martin. That's right. Yeah, from Batesville, oh, Arkansas. Little Mark. I'm, I'm really proud of the time I got to spend with Mark. I bet. He was brilliant. Ricky Rudd. I sent Ricky Rudd the link to this show, so hopefully he's tuned in. And I told him he's welcome to call in, of course. I sent it to uh He, he impressed people. me. If he does call in, you, you ask him to confirm the fact we ran 25 races, yeah. 10 of those races, which is 40%. We finished in the top 10, and he never crashed that car, and we raced 25 races with only one car. Wow. 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 Yeah. That's, that I, is, I confirmed that with him when I was writing the book. Wow. But <laughs> That's extremely impressive there. Uh, 25 races with the same car. Yes. All these stroke totally. race and photos the first are neat. top 10. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's a story in my book about Ricky's called Rooster Tales. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's cool. So, and yeah, there's a lot of these uh, from the Stroker Ace movie. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's Mike. Mm -hmm. And then and then Mike Hill. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. he's the one he posted on my Facebook page, and then he uh, texted me and said that that was him. And he was 19, I think he said, and now he's 67. I don't want to age him, but I think that's what he said he is now. So I, that can't, was, I can't count, so I don't, I don't know how that... <laughs> that was back. That's the book you need. Yeah, yeah. Boy, Mike, Mike was an outstanding Bert. employee. Yeah, there's Bert and, and Hal Needham, and then you under Bert's mm -hmm. right arm. That's the car that I drove in the movie. And the young guy on the end, was he in the movie, if I'm not mistaken? I know we've back. already scrolled through I, it. I, It'll scroll I, through think, pretty quick. N I think not. All right. All right it, so, he may have been there. They... they yeah hired me to, to do the maintenance work and keep the cars running and okay he was he was working for me so he's there now mm -hmm. but okay all right so if you're listening on the radio i know this doesn't make for that great a radio because you can't see the pictures but if you want to see them go to d ham i am on youtube and see us here but otherwise we're looking at some of the uh, the pictures that will was involved in with stroker ace and are these some in, of the drivers are these in the book a lot of these pictures in the book y yes that's it, it throughout the book i've Got ten chapters that are called my favorite ten builds. Can we get that at NASCARRedneck.com? Yes, sir. A place in order. I'm going to put that. Yeah, link if up you go to everybody. that there you go. website, yeah. you can go to the clear to the bottom and look at the uh, blog, and you can see what people that have read it are saying okay, about it. Yeah, and and yeah. just below that, you can see the list of the chapters, and the underneath the book, the pictures that are in the book come by as a slideshow on the internet okay okay well, that's cool that's uh nascar yeah and like i said the link's in the description of this video and phil's going to pop it up there as well all right so what we're going to do right we're going to take a quick break and then we will be right back to racing roots with ham and our guest will cronkright we'll be right back Hey, Ryan Scott, what you got going, buddy? Or Billy Buck, let me tell you, we've always been known to have the lowest price to sell vehicles, but folks didn't know we buy vehicles from folks right off the street. And right now, I need that extra car, truck, or SUV that's sitting in the driveway that you're not driving. Come bring it. Let me look at it. I will pay you cash on the spot. Get rid of that extra vehicle at Randy Marion Chevrolet in Statesville or Randy Marion Ford Lincoln. We need your vehicle today. 
Blue Harbor Bank is not your typical bank, right, Doug Hendricks? It's a great little bank. We're based out of Mooresville. All of our board of directors, our employees, and the vast majority of our customers are all from right here in Iredale County. So it's a great place to be. We have a great time as a team. The team here in Statesville consists of Jennifer Jolly and Tara Summers. They are the primary customer service folks for business and personal banking. Uh, Then we have Tom Kincaid as a commercial banker for this area. We also have the best mortgage banker in the area. That's Lisa Colvard, who many people have worked with at other banks. She's been in the market for over 20 years doing mortgages. And then yours truly, Doug Hendricks, and we have a great time working together. There's no competition between our employees for accounts or whatever. And because of that, then we don't have a lot of the issues that some banks have with people doing things they probably shouldn't do just to make a sale. Blue Harbor Bank with locations in Statesville, Mooresville, and Huntersville. Member FDIC. Would you like to change your health situation? Improve your current health with a wellness consultation with me, Fred Lowry, pharmacist and doctor of natural medicine. I'll work with you to reach your individual goals. This includes a review of your current medications, supplements, diet, and lifestyle choices. This is a progressive way to improve your current health position for your future. Great for individuals or couples wanting to make improvement. Call me at Lowry Drug in Statesville, 704-873-2247. All right, we're back to Racing Roots with Ham right here on 550 AM, 92.9 FM. And you can also watch us here on DHAM I Am on YouTube. And our guest this evening is Will Cronkrite. And that's exactly the way you say it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ten four. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a hard thing to say because you always want to say Walter Cronkite. Cronkite. You've heard that so many times. See, I almost said his name wrong. So. I, I answered it's anything that's close. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm not offended by Yeah. Well, I always make sure I double check the spelling and all before I go and post my anything on social media or whatever. I don't want to mess that up. You did a good job. That'd be embarrassing, but yes, thank you. And uh, so, yeah, we were going through those pictures of you at the Stroker Ace, but um, do we we probably should back up to the to the maybe the other drivers you worked with. You worked with Donnie Allison next, I believe, after Ricky Rudd. It's That's somewhere. correct. Okay, and so you you ended up. I actually to, worked with after after. Uh, Ricky, I worked with Ralph Moody on Janet Guthrie's car oh, yeah. for a season. Okay. And then, uh, oh, but a- after Ricky, I did go to work for, for Donnie. And I got fired okay. from Die Guard to this day. Don't have a clue why. Yeah, right. But that was on a Monday. We'd sat on the pole for the Firecracker 400. We sat on the pole for the Daytona 500 and won the pit crew competition. I was unclear why they didn't yeah. think I was useful, but mm. <laughs> they made that determination. On a Monday morning, I was unloading the car, and on Wednesday night, I was employed in Indianapolis, Indiana, working for a guy named Tom Adams. And that's what that's what this shirt okay. says. Two weeks ago, three members of that crew came to Charlotte, and we had a 47-year reunion of the crew members on, wow. that, on that car. 47 years. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. But well, that's one thing true in NASCAR for sure is that, you know, things change and sometimes you don't know why until later on you might realize, oh, yeah, I'm glad I made that move, I guess. You know? that, that turned out to be a good move for me, but I, I do not know why. Tom was trying to put together a team to come south, yeah. and they told me that Jigger Sirice, Jigger Sirice, a guy I drove for or that I worked on in Indianapolis, that's kind of a connection. Mm-hmm. In 1970, I went to work for the IndyCar team. Jigger Royce and I'm sorry, I don't remember the other guy's name. Were, were on the same team, and two doors down from us was AJ Foyt, and he kept talking about this scrawny taxi driver couldn't drive his other race car, just hollering back and forth. I didn't know anybody, so I didn't know. Yeah, but it turns out that was Donnie Allison. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's and I think taxi three driver. three years That's less than three name. years later, I was. About three and a half years later, I was Donnie's car chief at Die Garden. Yeah, how about that? I sent I sent him the uh, link to the tonight. I started to call him, but then um, anyway, maybe he's watching. But then I thought, yeah, maybe I could. We can ask him that question. I'd like to mention to him about the scrawny taxi driver. He'd probably laugh about that. Though. Well, he he I've read it's his book good. and it's a very interesting story. Yeah, Donnie, I'm. Uh, I hope he's not watching because I really admire Donnie. I mean, he was yeah. he was the best 
he was my mentor in terms of vehicle dynamics. He always, I, I read a lot of books, and so I figured I was sort of smart. Well, it turns out, you know, <laughs> I figured out one time he raced more than 300 times a year. Best thing I could do is shut up and listen to whatever he told me. <laughs> and it turns out you could believe anything he said. He had yeah. this way about it, and he'd come up to me. He put his finger in my chest, and he says, let me tell you one thing. Hmm. Was, and, and I learned to listen because whatever it was he was telling me was right. Yeah. I didn't always grasp it right off the bat, but in hindsight, particularly writing this book, I was I was I just became very appreciative of what Donnie took the time mm -hmm. to teach me. He the things that I read, he could make me understand what that felt like if you were holding the steering wheel. Sure. And I had never done that from the books. Mm -hmm. And Donnie was patient. He never, he ruffled my feathers, but I tried to never let him know. <laughs> sure, yes. Um, and that's what you have to do a lot in that well, scar too, right? I could not have had a better guy. I wish I wish I could have spent more time working with Donnie. Yeah. Total feel. Through the years, that's what the key is, is that chemistry between the driver and the crew chief to be able to figure out the communication of what you're trying to say to each other. Well, he just he just knew stuff, stuff you wouldn't yeah, think, sure. stuff you didn't don't read in a book. Changing opinion angle, why you want this kind of caster gain or camber gain? This, I learned an awful lot from Donnie. I, I've written an unpublished book on vehicle dynamics that I'd like to share with him someday. Though. Mm -hmm. uh, him and his brother Bobby, obviously they, they were they were both very intelligent. And somebody that can get in their airplane and fly to the next racetrack and jump in a car and, and drive and win or whatever. Mm -hmm. if, if you read Donnie's <laughs> book, it's called As I Recall. Mm -hmm. um, the Alabama gang used to run 300 races a year. You got to pick up something. Yeah. <laughs> right. Racing 300. Exactly. Yeah. Racing 300 times a year. Yeah. And you see a lot of the old pictures of them. They're just like covered in sweat covered in dirt and i mean they were yeah the old saying it's practice just, makes perfect that that's what i was mm -hmm. talking to donnie about a while back here that if you look at the race car drivers nowadays they're walking straight up no limps all their fingers are clean none of them are bent <laughs> yeah and they're clean behind the ears they don't it's right you don't recognize them as yeah. i didn't recognize them as drivers because i so i was going to say with a different um, breed yeah, sorry about that. I was going to say, uh, Don Clark was talking about that was uh, Parker Stevenson, but I believe you were saying that they were all uh, pit crew member guys. There they they in the were. Picture. Those were guys that worked for me other than Hal and Bert. Yeah, okay. Yes, but that was a good observation there, Don, because I know he was with the Hardy, Boy Hardy Boys and also in the Stroke Race movie, I believe so. And uh, let's see who else we got here. Rachel Rodman's down in Charlotte. She says, uh, ask Phil Will for funny stories of favorite memories of – Dale Senior, and we'll probably get into that when you when we get up to him as the driver. So you went, you worked for Donnie Allison, and then that was at Dyguard, and but then that lasted not even a year or less so. Less than a year, right? Yeah. I went to work in in Hueytown. I, I took all my books. I had fifty seven books in a milk crate. Mm. I, I brought them down there. And Donnie and I had never experienced anybody. We probably crossed paths at the racetrack or something, but we, you know we never had a conversation. So when Rossi hired me, and I brought in this milk crate full of books. Have you met Donnie? I mean, yes. You know he doesn't. Yeah, we had him on the show. Like books about <laughs> how to make a car handle, mm -hmm. and I said, "Where do you want me to put these books?" He says, "Oh, they look pretty important. Go put them over there behind the air compressor and stack that case of oil on them so they don't get blown away." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, you probably should, should listen to Donnie. He's a little scrappy too, you know. I just he he, uh, he would say Bobby would start the fight and he would finish him. I I, I can tell you. <laughs> For sure, on three occasions, I've heard Bobby Allison say in equal cars, Donnie was the better driver. Hmm. Okay. And we, I'm, we heard Donnie say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. He said he was better than Richard no, Petty, basically. I, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. He said, it. my record was better. Well, I had asked him, <laughs> I had proposed a question. My question to him was like, I meant to say, what was it like to be around Richard and David Pearson, were they tension or were they buddy buddy? Um, and he, I think Donnie took it was like, wow, what was it like to be around those guys? And he was more or less like, well, let me tell you about records. 
This is my percentage of record, and Richard Petty won seven of them Daytona 500s, but I give him three of them. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay. Yeah. I, I, I wrote in, in the book that I wrote about Donnie, it, it was called uh, The Huey Town Speed Merchant. I, I lost my train of thought there. What were we talking about there? Donnie. Donnie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Donnie in yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, and, and records. And, yeah, and, yeah. and in, in that story... I lamented the fact that I put more laps as driver of the tow truck than Donnie got to put on the racetrack. We couldn't keep a motor in that car. Yeah. And I, just, I, I didn't quite pick that up till I started doing the research for the book. That <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't give him a chance. He's, yeah. He's, yeah. So I just got a text from uh, Cliff Champion, and he said to tell you hello. Oh. And I, and I know we're probably going to end up talking about his uncle at some point. Bill, because he worked yep. with you. Um, Donnie Allison, Bill Champion. When I was working for Die Guard, we were at Martinsville, and Donnie was having problems with his brakes. Mm -hmm. We came in, and he actually lost his brakes. Well, in the meantime, we were getting ready to load the car up at the end of the race, and in comes the, this Bill Champion car. And in it is this little curly-haired kid. And I think I wrote in the book, is it was a size 28 boy in a size 44 uniform. Got out of that car, and it was Ricky. Ricky had got in, built Champion's car at Martinsville. Didn't tell, never been in a car, never been in a cup car before. Never said anything to NASCAR, yeah. <laughs> nothing. He just went and got a helmet out of the truck. He had his, his helmet and got Bill's driver in uniform. You know, pit stop, they just changed drivers. So. Uh -huh. And Donnie complained. He said that, what's the number of that car, 10? Whatever Bill, I think it was 10. Yeah. He said, that darn 10 car kept backing into me because <laughs> 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 these brakes weren't going good. But anyway, that, yeah. that was my first crossing path with, with Ricky. Cl Cliff was probably the greatest contributor to Ricky Rudd's career of anybody that I saw. He was a big help when I was with him. I know he worked with him before I got involved. I know he worked with him at Die Guard after I was involved. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Cliff's the Ricky Rudd guy as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, he, he um, when I had him on here and Ricky Rudd called and talked to him. I saw that. So surprise him. That I saw good. that, yeah. Yeah, very good. I like a lot of respect for Cliff Champion. He's one great fella. Yeah, he's he's under – he's underrated as are a number of those fellows from that time period yeah um, i wanted to ask you a question right quick and this goes back to working in ellerby but i remember you saying that you were you worked 100 hours you worked you made a hundred dollars for a hundred hours a week hundred dollars an hour i mean one dollar an hour basically. there were many a day many a weeks <laughs> we worked more than a hundred hours yeah i struggle mm -hmm. at math so <laughs> well a hundred hours yeah. and a hundred dollars is a pretty easy math project yeah, yeah. about that <laughs> all right so and then you um and then when when you went from there, you went on to uh, was it was around seventy seven. That was when I went to work in Indianapolis for Tom Adams okay. on a USAC team. Okay, and that would have been a really good deal. He wanted to come south. When I got let go from Die Guard, Jigger Royce was the driver of the car. He thought that Bobby Allison called and let them know that a Southern mechanic was available that might be considered going to uh, Indianapolis. And they did. They, I mean, they, I went right there. Two days later, I was working. In, and I liked that, working with Jigger. He was a guy that I worked with on the IndyCar. Mm -hmm. He and I had a really keen ability to understand what each other was saying. I, we, Somebody took the bag of money or something, you know, just ran out of money. So yeah. that was what made me start my own shop. I got let go at Die Guard, and then this team folded because of lack of money. And mm -hmm. the way I saw it, was if you were, weren't running well, the sponsor said something to the owner, the owner said something to the crew chief, and the crew chief had to fire somebody. Yeah. And my toolbox was so big, I didn't want to be moving it, so I started my own shop. That's a good reason, too, right? My, I mean, my, I've been accused of having to put a license plate on my toolbox oh. when I moved it. <laughs> I, still, I still have that toolbox. How about that? I want to say hello to Mike Bear. He's tuned in. I believe he's maybe... Ohio, I'm gonna guess at that. Dickie Dennis is up in Virginia. Do you remember a guy in 2014? He climbed a fence at Richmond, Virginia, at the race. He climbed up on the fence, hung out there for a little while, and then yeah, during the race. What year? 
2014, he climbed up on turn four at Richmond, up on top of the fence during the race. Oh, no. I, yeah, I, they threw the ca- the caution flag. That's our <laughs> Nicky Dennis. He's our, he's our I'm main sorry man. I missed that, but yeah. I did. Oh, There's yeah. lots of videos of it. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. It's on YouTube. Was that the gentleman that called in? That's the one that's uh, commenting on our YouTube. It'll be over here in the Was comments. Was the guy that crawled on the fence? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he tunes in every week from us. He's up in Virginia, Dickie Dennis. Yeah, that's right. And uh, Don Clark. Rundies. Oh, yeah, that's a, it's a funny story. So, well, maybe one of these days, excuse me, we'll get him down here. <coughs> and we got uh, Don Clark here in Statesville. Excuse me for that. And Jody Brooke. Fields for I haven't met her yet. She's up in Sterling, Kentucky, right? Well, she is this weekend. She's originally from Geneva, New York, where I'm from that area. But she's visiting friends in Kentucky and going down to watch a graduation in South Carolina. And hopefully tomorrow when her and her friend come through Charlotte, I can meet them for lunch. There you go. Cool. Well, that sounds good. Yeah. And so Randy Hams, my uncle down in Gastonia, he was always a huge Dale Earnhardt fan. He was such a big Dale Earnhardt fan, he had a picture of him hanging in his living room, if that tells you anything. So... <laughs> Yes, and uh, all right, and so yeah, and speaking of Dale Earnhardt, I guess we're getting close to that time. Uh, Kenny Colesback, you know Kenny Colesback, Carbon Kenny. He says uh, Howard and Anita Milligan. Yes, who who sent that in? Kenny Colesback. We call him Carbon Kenny. Uh, Howard yeah. Howard Milligan was who I worked for that was preparing the cars for Jigger at Indy in 1970. Oh, okay. And I went to work out to their place, and they were an interesting couple. We'll probably pass on any additional. There you go. <laughs> I got you. Comments. All right. It's Super Jason. What's up? All right. So, yeah. So, 1978, you're rolling up into Charlotte. Uh, Jim Dooley in Virginia. Hey there. He says, hey, Phil, love your voice commentary, especially when you say Jersey Cape Yachts, motorboating. And who was that? Uh, Dickie, uh, Jim Dooley in Virginia. Oh, Jim do, do, Dooley. Do you have the uh, picture uh, of the car like, I pulled Dale's first race car home from Charlotte on the, the pickup truck in the orange trailer. I'm going to find it, and maybe I can pop it up here. Yeah, While Phil says. Uh, the, the difference in that rig and what I ended up with was enormous. Oh, okay. Yeah, between. Yeah, I hope you, can, hope you can find that picture. Cause yeah, I'll look for that here whenever you uh, that, we'll start telling the story about. Um, 1978, I guess, whenever you – how did you get to to be the first – let's see, this picture right here, the car, the car owner basically for – Dale Sr. Dale, Dale Sr. Sr. Yeah, Dale Earnhardt Sr. So, yeah. That was a, that was a car that Humpy put together uh, and helped me buy from Bud Moore. And, boy, Bud was another guy that treated me right. I, I got called by Humpy Wheeler, wanted to know if I'd be interested in being – the, a car owner crew chief for the first African-American stock car driver. And, and my only question was, you know, can, is this somebody going to pay me? And there was, you know, and, and there was, I just wanted to make, I just wanted to make sure what they were doing. And so we got this car from Bud and Bud set the car up, knew that there was going to be a new person in it, but it was going to be Willie T. Ribs. And uh, uh, we went up there and, and Willie was not, not, going well he wasn't driving to suit humpy and humpy was actually drawing on a table napkin about where he should be at the gate in the union 76 ball in different places and th- they just weren't getting along at all Hump- and humpy was getting frustrated and willie was getting frustrated and um last i saw willie t ribs he came down pit road went about three pit stalls past us, pulled so close to the pit wall that when he got out, he stepped over the pit wall, mm-hmm. and I haven't seen him. Yeah. And he got into a little bit of trouble with with the law, driving the pace car or a car that Charlotte Motor Speedway provided for them the wrong way on a downtown street in Cincinnati, in Charlotte. And I'm paraphrasing <laughs> Yeah. This is not a history book. I'm paraphrasing some of the stuff that I read oh, from Tom Higgins in the Charlotte Observer. Oh, yeah. But they pulled, they lit him up, and he pulled over and got out of the car and kind of left. And what I heard and talked to Tom was that w- Willie went into this gymnasium and started playing with a basketball, figuring an African-American playing basketball in Charlotte's Dunst's not going to stand out, but the, the police came in and right away backed him up against the wall. And he said, 
um, how'd you know it was me? <laughs> oh. And he said, son, this is an all-girls school. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, wow. There you go. Well, he raced in the SRX race the other night. I, I <laughs> still think he was a talented guy. I don't know why he was having problems with the stock car. I just, it had to feel different in the Trans Am cars. It was heavier. I know it was harder to break, but I, I'm i certainly happy the way it turned out, but I, I, sure. I wish we could have got a little bit further with Willie before things fell apart. Sometimes you just got to get out of your own way. I, I'm not <laughs> yeah. a ju judge of driver <laughs> like a talent, so I, I don't yeah. have a comment there. But yeah. he, was, he, I, I, he was very pleasant. Yeah. He was well mannered, well spoken, talent, yeah. but he he and Humpy just were having a hard time, and and how that transpired from there was Humpy called me and he said, you know, I've sent your driver back to California, and, and of course I'm disheartened. I'm thinking there goes sure. my there goes sure. my deal. Yes, Thanks. that that was that is my that is my mm. truck that I drove wow. all the time. 72? I think it's a 74. 74. Uh, okay. I think. Yeah. Yeah. When it came, this came up suddenly, I did not have a trailer that could take that car <laughs> to Charlotte. So I called a gentleman, and I, I think I can get away with it now. I was doing some work for a gentleman named Leon Boomershine in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Wow. I was putting a body on a car he bought from Darrell Waltrip. And I'm worried that this deal came up and I don't have a trailer to take my Dale Earnhardt car to Charlotte. And I called around, tried to borrow a trailer, and I ended up calling Leon. I said, oh, there's a trailer out in my yard. And I called him in, there, in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. I said, Leon, can I borrow that trailer to go to Charlotte? Well, he told me no. <laughs> Apparently he had it borrowed or something. He did not want that. <laughs> But I figured I could get to Charlotte and back before he could get yeah. here from Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, I borrowed so, that. But, and it's classic. the tongue you can see is about yeah. dragging the ground. And yeah. I, yeah. I bought all new pit equipment and nitrogen tanks and stuff. That truck was loaded down. I, that truck was so, so loaded down, my spare tire was back there. I bought a new tire so I wouldn't have to unload all that stuff <laughs> <laughs> to change a, a flat uh, tire. But. Yeah, that's cool. That looks like your normal uh, dirt track racing on a Saturday night. That's exactly right. Yeah. I'm, 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 in hindsight, I'm, I'm happy to see the picture, but I was a little embarrassed with it. Oh, this is yeah. this part of the story. Yeah. We get there, and Humpy says, I got some money for you. When you get here, come up to the office. I'll give you some money. Mm -hmm. So I go up there, and he gave me $3,500. Now I'm thinking, oh, wow. hot dog, I'm yeah. liking this. And so we, we go down there, and the next day, oh, no, is that after, later that afternoon, I put that money in my pocket. And that afternoon, the, the gentleman that sponsored the car from a Cardinal Tractor Company, can't remember his name, walked up to me and says, hello, I'm so-and-so, I own the company. I said, I got some money for you. So he gave me $3,500. Hmm. And I'm thinking, boy, this is getting better and better. And then I figured out that that was the same $3,500. The money he gave oh. me oh. was supposed to go to Humpy. Humpy just oh. fronted me that money, right? I so I put it in my pocket, and, and I didn't spend it. Yeah. But I had it in my pocket for three days, and when we were leaving, Humpy came up to me, and he said, you know, how'd you like this? He said, how'd you like this race? And I, gosh, I won $4,500. I got $3,500. So I'm just thinking, gee, mm -hmm. I should have got in this racing before now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, I've got that money that, that Bill gave me, he said, this is yours. And I had this envelope pulled out. Money was folded up in all $100 bills. And I handed it to him, and he looked at my truck, and he said, you keep it. Why don't you go buy you another truck? Oh, oh wow. And I did, he, so he gave me that money. So That's nice. I was That's pretty, awesome. What's that come to? $11,000. $11, yeah, I, I thought yeah. that was pretty yeah. pretty hot stuff. Sure. Yeah. I went and got a tire truck, a, a, one of Huggins' tire trucks and painted it. Hmm. Um, there's pictures of that in the book as well. Yeah, Humpy is a classy guy. He, he he did so many things behind the scenes for the sport and for drivers. He was so good to me. Yeah. He, he wrote the foreword for my book. Is that right? And he's yeah. I wish I I wish I was as good as he yeah, thought I was. He is <laughs> such or a that great he wrote it. As he wrote. He and I've got to be we've got to be pretty good friends. Humpy's got a 1964 AJ Watson 
Indy Roadster hanging from the garage in his house. Hmm. Wow. I hope it's okay to say that. Sorry, yeah, honey. That'd sir. Be beautiful. <laughs> I'm sure he's got security. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, he, he okay. was instrumental in getting Ricky and I together, too. Mm. So Humpy was very okay. helpful to me. So that must be why there's a picture of him and you and Ricky talking. Yes. There at the yeah. car. So the um, the... <clears throat> I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, he's still around, though, too, right? He's still... Humpy? Yes. Oh, yeah. He was oh, yeah. on uh, yeah. one of those shows. He does... American Pickers. He does uh, speeches and stuff like that. He does a lot of that. I met him up at Bill Ryan's in Denver. Um, did you meet with Bill Ryan? No. I no. Oh, really? You need, you need to. He's... He found one of my cars, my, a mountain car that was in the Burt Reynolds movie and restored it. I had a... Unusual design. I, I've, I just really got deep into suspension and vehicle dynamics, and I started twisting cars because I thought the weakest part of the car was the front third, and it's the point where the roll center changes the fastest. And so a flexible unit where you're trying to control roll center heights, my thought was bad, so I started twisting cars to get a a less flexible car so I could control the change in the roll center heights. And, uh, <coughs> oh, man, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought. Tell me sorry, again. Sorry, I choked so on you were, the information. Uh, you were, uh, yeah. The what? <laughs> Taking it in. He's choking on the information. I, said, I choked said, on all that information going uh, in. Oh. So roll about, center of the car. You're talking about twisting the car. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah but uh, that, the reason for that was there was a roll center, a roll couple distribution that I got into. So I started just changing the stiffness of the car measuring that and one of the cars one of the designs was an, a y-shaped convergence from the front hoop dash bar up to the screw jack and there's a car it, it, it it's an unusual design and in my opinion they're still utilizing that approach even now in my opinion not quite as efficiently um but Bill Ryan knew about that, and so he was looking to find one of my cars to restore. Bill Ryan's got 68 original stock cars from 19, in, in that 70s and 80s, and 64 of them he has restored as immaculate as you can to the appropriate kind of heads and valves and mm -hmm. mufflers and seats. Yeah. And somebody found one of my cars up in the mountains of North Carolina and called him, and he's they. It turned out it was the car, it was the movie car from, from the Burt Reynolds movie. Oh, yeah. The car you see in the winter circle, it's oh. got two little holes in the A post. That's how we identified it. Cool. Mm -hmm. So he found that car and then he restored it as a Jolly Rancher car. Wow. Bill Rines is his, an, a historically talented gentleman, as you'll find about that era of NASCAR. Okay. I saw that, that Jolly Rancher hmm. car. I've seen that before. And... So uh, you were, John Callis, we're going to get into the Earnhardt thing again, too, but I know he had bought one of those cars. Well, it was somehow connected. John, John bought the second edition of the change to the original Earnhardt car. Okay. And I, I talked to John. John's a talented motor builder. Do you know John? Oh, yeah, he was on last <laughs> week. Yeah. Next time you talk to John, ask uh -huh. him how many tires he bought his first race at Dover. Oh yeah, how many were used? Oh, he. I think he ended up having a new set there at some point. And he only like, ran one set of tires a whole race at Dover. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. I don't know cool. if he wants anybody to know that. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, John. John's been a, a good friend of mine. Well, I, I changed that car to a big Thunderbird, and then somehow John ended up with it mm. as a Pontiac, I think. Okay. And he yeah, sold it, and as my understanding is, that car got tore up someplace. It's yeah chewed up because i'd sure i'd sure like to have had that chassis back yeah i bet there's a lot of cars you'd like to have back you know like just like you sell your old um whatever car you think oh, it's a piece of junk yeah. and you sell it now but yeah. then years oh, later yeah, you're like yeah. man i'd love to have that car back well you're probably the same way about your race cars <laughs> or his pickup truck that he holds that car yeah. with right yeah. he's go. looking now you for i now. built a car mm -hmm. that was really really fast i I think it was the world's fastest stock car for three years. It'll, it'll, there'll be people that want to argue with that, but sure. at, at Talladega, long story, 
I built a car, and and Junior Johnson was building, re, rebuilding my motors, and he was good to me. And I think what was happening was he was rebuilding my motors very economically, with the stipulation that I don't touch anything and you know, stick it in there and leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Well, he did that a number of times, and we went to Talladega with Elliot Forbes Robinson with this car, the first edition of my car that I twisted. It was the design that I wanted and I was after some aerodynamic stuff <laughs> so we built that car and had Junior's motor in it and we qualified 13th or something on the first day at Talladega Elliot couldn't drive this car he said in a 40 acre field and Talladega tires just, I was under the impression you could run them forever so they, they were a year old and we'd been we painted the car around we bought a new set of tires and put them on went out 20 minutes after practice closed Benny Parsons sat on the pole at 200 point 013 or something, mm. just barely over 200. We, we went 203.1. Wow. wow. <laughs> and, you know, I, I hesitated to put that in the book until I authorized that, but yeah, sure. The, the gentleman, at Tom Higgins, yep, Tom. two years ago, yep. validated that. He said he'd seen the notes mm. and he actually wrote something in a paper. He said, um, so, so at any rate, we're going really fast. The crowd get, got around us there at Talladega and we're sitting up on them old wooden tables workbenches and junior comes by and he's we just outran him <laughs> four four miles an hour you know he, and it was his motor so he he came down he picked up the hood he, he says can we pick up the hood and he looked at it and he walked on one side and walked around looked at the other side and kept looking at me and put the hood down put the clamps claps back in the hood pins as he walked off he looked up the side of that car and took two steps and then he backed up Took his thumbs and put them on the side of that bib overall, looked up the side of that car, and he just winked at me. <laughs> that car was three and a quarter inches narrower than anybody else down there. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that nobody sounds, picked on me because I was mm, a peripheral. That sounds like a smoky eunuch story there. Yeah. Or a car. <laughs> smoky. Um, That's pro hey, let's get into that next after we take a quick break, if you don't mind. No, I'm looking. Okay. All right. So we're going to take a quick break and also want to thank. Uh, Jersey Cape Yachts, right, Phil? Jersey Cape Yachts, that's right. And uh, so where they are located up in New Jersey, and they're, they're uh, let's see, they sell their custom yachts, 31 wow. to 66 foot, I believe yep, it is. So. The little devil all the way up to the big Diablo. Yep, so you can buy one of those, put it out on Lake Norman, have your own custom yacht. That's and, right. And yeah. then also you can stay and Phil will get some more information on them. They're, they have a uh, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, YouTube channel, and yep. Twitter, and Jersey Cape Yacht. can be reached at 609-965-8650. JerseyCapeYachts.com. Yep. And also Great RV Life. That's G-R-8, the letter, the number eight. I'm sorry. I never was good at math. Anyway, G-R-8, <laughs> RV Life. Check them out. If you ever need to rent an RV, I mean, it's a pretty cool deal. It's, here. it's brand new here in Statesville in Iredell County. If you want to rent an RV, let's say you want to take it anywhere in the country, of course, you can't drive across the ocean, but you take it to racetracks, cool. uh, any campgrounds, all that kind of stuff. And you don't have to worry about the expense of owning one, you know, because that can get very expensive with insurance, tires, uh, all that kind of stuff, you know. It is. So, yes, <laughs> Phil knows, yes. Yep. So I think it's one of the greatest ideas. And, and to connect yeah. it with this show and racing and all that kind of stuff, it's going to be a perfect match, Yeah, I do believe. So, all right, so we'll be right back with Racing Roots with Ham. We've got Walt, uh, Will Cronkright on here with us this evening. So we're going to talk about his his NASCAR, his racing roots. And if you got questions, put them on our D Ham I Am on YouTube and put a big cube in front of it so that I know it's going to be a question. And we will be right back. To Ryan Scott over here at the Chevy store. What's going on, Ryan? Billy Buck, we did run into each other. We are running all over this place. We are trying to fill the lots. If you've been out looking for a new car, truck, or SUV lately, you've noticed the inventories, well, they're a little light. That is all over, but I tell you, Randy Marion Chevrolet in Statesville and Randy Marion Ford Lincoln, because of the Randy Marion King of Price, King of Inventory, we do have a selection of inventory. So come see us today for that new car, truck, SUV. It's summertime. It's vacation time. We've got your vehicle. Come see us today, whether it's the Chevy store off of I-40 or the Ford Lincoln store off of 77, our beautiful new stores. Come see us today. 
When you live a busy life, it's hard to keep your floors clean and in good condition. AM and 92.9 FM and D Ham I am on YouTube if you want to check us out here in the Randy Marion studio and uh, pop us up show us your questions and any comments that you have you want to talk to Will Cronkrite here and uh, we will get those answered for you so uh, thanks everybody for tuning in on the radio and on YouTube but we're we're deep into it now we're about halfway through your career at this point <laughs> Something like that. When well, we do have a chance, we do have one question that's come in already. Yeah. All right. Hold on one second. I was going to tell you, I know, um, I know Tom Higgins, our coach's grandson in baseball for oh, two cool. years. So we talked all the time and I love listening to his stories. And what was the question, Tracy? Okay. So Scott Felthausen says, Mr. Cronkite, which cars were easier to set up, the big cars or the 110 cars? I only worked on the big cars. There you go. So I, I'm not the appropriate person to answer that question. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, there you go. That's a good question, though. So keep them coming if y'all have them. And I'm I didn't sure find any of them particularly easy. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right, so we're back to uh, 1978. So Willie T. Ribs did that kind of didn't work out. So then Earnhardt calls. Right. So uh, Humby called and said, "You're going to hear your name on TV tonight." He said. Um, I don't remember that sportscaster's name. Um, Harold Johnson. Harold Johnson's. <laughs> and so yes. that came on the TV, and it said, you know, Willie T. Ribs and has been let go from the, his potential ride at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. And Harold just keeps talking about it, and I'm telling you, 15 seconds later, the phone rings, and it's Dale. He says, can I drive that car? And I said, this is sort of a, it's kind of a deal car. It's not mine to make that decision. He says, do you care if I ask Humpy? And I said, no, I'm happy to do that. Dale and I had been working. We'd both been breaking right front springs, and I think I determined that if you, we put the ground on the coil and then welded the pin at the bottom to keep it from rotating, that arc from the ground was setting a stress concentration in the spring because we'd both broke some about halfway up. Hmm. So I, th that's where I knew him. We just working out a few problems. We weren't friends or buddies. He never drove anything that I had worked on. And so he says, can I, do you care if I call him? I said, no, I don't. And another minute goes by and Humpy called me back. He says, you care if Dale drives that car? And Humpy says, I ask him, you think he can keep it off the wall? But I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he's, he said, yeah. yeah. So Dale calls back again. And Harold Johnson is still talking about this on the on the tv so it couldn't have been yeah. a three four minute deal yeah and it was all set up and i write in my book um that, that chapter is called my introduction to ironhead i'm paraphrasing i think he lived 50 miles away and he got there in 45 minutes and he was in this old blue pickup and he had this little boy with him and I, you know you know who it was mm -hmm. and it's it's I, I was talking to dale jr three or four weeks ago, I, I wrote about something that I did not put in the book, but I told him and he thought it was really funny. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to say it here either. Uh, I, think he, I think he wants to ask me himself. But no, I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell you. Yeah. This boy's watching us out the side window and never says a word. Window's rolled halfway down, little snot running out of his nose he's got a cold or something's running down the side of the windshield uh, the side window never said a word we go out there and we were talking where i was talking to dale jr was that his dad has a reputation of having an attitude but i said i never saw that mm -hmm. he was always kind you know we were both just trying to do the same same things and he would look and see if how junior was doing out there in a truck and uh gosh i hope i don't get in trouble with him. <laughs> <laughs> Statue of limitations is so he goes he goes out there and he's we're we're done getting a seat this this other story that 
my introduction to Iron Hearts about him coming down. We fit that seat. That's a really, he really impressed me that night. I knew then he was a, a bright fella. Well, anyway, this is all done. It's two or three in the morning. He goes out there and, and I was telling Dale Jr. I said, your dad actually, when he first come out to open the door, he said, damn it, Dale. <laughs> and then he, he, I could tell he was having to change a heart. He, he, he calm down a little bit and he said son it looks like you've spilled your drink don't worry i'll get you another one <laughs> mm -hmm. but when he opened the door a little bit further <laughs> i said dale i said i could tell i said how'd i put that i said i can tell the difference i can smell the difference between piss and pepsi and that wasn't pepsi did you smell <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> Was, did I? Yes. You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> How about that? I, I told That's him, and he laughed. So I think yes. it, I think it's okay. To oh yeah, I'm sure it's fine. But I didn't That's put good. that. In, I didn't put that in the book. But. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's all good. I sent him the uh, link to the video. Maybe he'll watch. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, there was another question Scott had apparently. So, um, so anyway, we're up to so Dale and Hart gets in the car and then drives at Charlotte. How'd that go? W went well went fast right from the beginning bud moore set the chassis up for us and mm -hmm. at this time i'm starting to think i understand a little bit about handling yeah. so I, I changed one spring and i changed the sway bar but we put it back mm -hmm. dale and i had an agreement to run five races but he wanted to run but he got a deal before the last race with Austerlin. they were going to hire him for next year and they wanted to know if i wouldn't skip one of my races so Dale could drive one race for them and not lose his eligibility to be a rookie. Mm -hmm. Dale had said he'd drive six, five for me, and he asked if he could, and you, you, you can't say no. I mean, right. you, you know he's going to a better place. Yeah. And uh, so I said, fine. Was well, it ends up, Baxter Price, I think, qualified and started the fifth race, but at the first caution, Dale got in that car and finished the race. I, that was a big deal for me that he yeah. he could have just sat that one out, but he said he'd drive five, and I guess because I yeah. didn't stand in his way, he he owned up to his word. I think he ran well enough. The second race we ran was at the Daytona, was the Firecracker 400. And, you know, some days you're on, some days you stink, but, boy, we were really we were smelling good at that Firecracker 400. We were running really good really good and in, in a book i write we, we were down a lap we'd give him a really bad pit stop but we were running fast we were running with the big guys there's 20 laps to go or something and and they've come around us they came around us once but it took them a little while to get around and a caution come out and so i know those guys there's three or four of them going to put four tires on there's enough enough time left to, that they're going to want to have all four tires so he came in we just put two tires and just enough gas to finish the race, and he went out. So he got out ahead of them. But they had to run him hard for five laps before they could get around him. I mean, he was – we mm. were good. You know, it's just one of them yeah. days when your crap's in a bucket. We were – we mm. were and, – and I'm convinced that's what Osterlin saw that might have given him a chance to do it because we, we were mediocre at Talladega and we stunk at Darlington. So. Yeah. That sounds it's, it's neat hearing your side of that story and all too, because we had like Doug Richard on here, and you know he talked a lot about that when they first got Earnhardt in that car, and I believe uh, Tracy's dad built some of the cars, built those chassis or whatever. Yeah, Doug did Dale good. Yeah, yeah, that was a good combination. And then they won won the championship in 1980, I believe the first one, something like that. Eight nine eight, that would have been right. So, I, I think, think so. Yeah, yeah, 79 Rookie of the Year or something or whatever. How all that worked out? Oh, there's another another Rotate. story in that first race. Yeah, I got we got radios. You know, I'm I'm really pumped up. We got a radio, yeah. one radio. He's got one, and I got one. We're hot stuff. And he calls in, and somebody's mirror driving him. He says, "You care if I spin this guy out?" And I said, "Can you do it without hurting our car?" And he says, "Yeah, I believe I can." He said, "I'm gonna give him three laps." And he just this guy kept mirror driving him. They'll come in. He. he Come off of four before he gets to the flag stand. He keys the mic and says, "Watch this." He ran that guy down, went down low, and ran up across the back of his spoiler. That car got loose and just slid like that. And Dale went right underneath him, pulled around. He he knew yeah. that that first race. Yeah. He how knew how he was going to do that. Yeah. And that night we were putting the seat in the car, 
I thought we were going to drill some different holes and he was going to change the padding. We ended up cutting the seat rails out, the floor pan. We dropped the floor pan an inch. And if you see, look at his car, you see any pictures of him, yeah. he's sitting back and he's down. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't yeah. my idea, yeah. but I was the first one to his do it. Eye, his eyes would barely be above but you the know rail. But you know why sure. he did that? I didn't understand this. We worked four or five hours, and I was scrawny back then. He said, you don't know why we did all this, do you? And I said, no, but I said, it's like, you know, being married, you know, if mom was not happy, we ain't going right. faster. Yeah. So I said, well, get in the car. So I got in, and he says, when you run that car in the first turn at Charlotte, you just come over that bump. Where's that car in front of you? And I just pointed in front of to the wall, and yeah. <laughs> made sense to me. He said, well, where's the car in front of him? And I looked at him. It's right there. And he went, no. It's he says, there. think about this. He says, it's up in this corner. Yeah. That's where you're looking. Oh, I, that made me... And then if you're really sinking, proud of him, <laughs> if, you're, if your butt is an inch or yes, two sir. lower down, he was you giving can himself it. a head start sure. huh. on avoiding something. Yeah. That didn't just impress the heck out of me. Yeah, that is impressive. I know Phil's taking a lot of pictures of him sitting in that car yeah. over those years. Yeah, that that's an interesting. I have not heard that one before. Yeah, we spent Very some good. time changing that darn seat. Yeah. So well, that's where all the good drivers say they feel yeah. the feel the cars from the right there on the bottom of their butt. That's where they get that feel of a car. Right. Yep. See those pants. <laughs> so what so is your best Dale Earnhardt story? <laughs> one of yeah, one of the funnier ones was we were at Talladega at the start of the Stroke Race movie, the first place we went. And I'd been involved, I guess, maybe 10 or 12 years by then, and it's Talladega, and you can't really screw a setup at Talladega. But the stunt guys were saying they couldn't, they couldn't drive my real race, the real race car. They were having trouble, particularly going into turn three. So I went and asked Bud, would he let Dale drive my car? And I admire Bud for saying yes, he didn't have to do that. I mm -hmm. understand you wouldn't put somebody in somebody else's car, but I, must, I feel like he trusted my setup enough that he let Dale do it and Dale did it he went out and he said he came back in he said there's nothing wrong with this car he said what's the problem he said the guys are having trouble getting into three and he looked over my shoulder and he says is it are the stunt guys a tall guy and a short blonde and he said I said yeah he said well let, let them get up here a little bit closer and they got up a little bit closer and he just says you know there's nothing wrong with this car he says if they can't drive it I'll give you my mom's phone number. She can drive this car. <laughs> and them guys just, they got really embarrassed. And, and sure. he told them just, I, I think what he was telling them was to just trail break a little bit, not come all the way off the gas going in there. But he, Oh, the other thing he says at Talladega, because I'm, I'm trying to drive the, the, the number seven car, the 711 car. And I've, I'm not a race car driver, and so I was driving – maybe 170 or something, you know, <laughs> not fast as a regular guy, not as fast as a car would go. Car's jumping all around, and I figure I'm scared that I'm shaking or something. So I come in, tape the steering wheel, and change the belts, and tuck in my arms, go back out, and it's still jumping around. So I said, Dale, I said, I'm, I must be scaring myself. He said, no. He said, that's that's just how it is. He says it feels different when you go by a gate. It'll, it'll act different going through guardrail than it will up against concrete. And, and the stunt guys were here for this, too. And one of them guys said over my shoulder, he says, is it true you can see air? And he said, he's talking to me now, he says, Will, you know where the grandstand, the grandstand addition at Darlington at the backstretch where it drops down a step, sits a couple rows back? And I said, yeah. He says, I can tell you when a fat lady in the third row gets up and goes after popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, about that. You kind of have to believe he did think he could see air. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's something you always hear about him for sure. I'm going to put this picture up and see if we can. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you talk about it a little bit because that's one I was interested in. And we'll be able to see it here on the screen in just a second. Here they said as far as seeing air, I don't know if he could see air, but that open face helmet might have been able to feel the air move across his face. Possibly, you know. Donnie pointed some stuff out to me. I'm kind of a neat person. I it was my job as a car chief. I had tried to keep the car clean. But driving that car at Talladega, my face got all scratched up. There's stuff that gets stuck down in between the welded panels and that sort of stuff that it won't vacuum out it doesn't come out till it's 
vibrate, vibrate and stuffing yeah. around. So I, I believe that, whatever they... Lonnie Anderson. Yep. Mm. So, so in this picture, I saw another one where her like dress was blown up a little bit, right? Well, you don't you have that one? Well, it's, in, it's in, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe I won't put that one on I here, do. but it's yeah. just uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, but just tell us about this picture right here. It's I've seen it many years this, ago. This was at Atlanta, and and that's me, knee to knee with that young lady. Yeah. And all the pit equipment I I provided for that movie, and I was working with the guy that. It goes around, sets up all the scenery before they do the shooting, this B group or something. <clears throat> and we had set that pit that, for that scene. We'd set that up in an afternoon, and they didn't get to it. So when we come in the next day, the deal is Johnny Hayes has got that air hose, and he's messing with her. And so he shoots that air hose up her dress, and it blows her dress up high enough that you can see her underwear. But because the air hose sat out all night... When he blew that air up, it just wet her from oh. from from knee to, oh. to belly button. Yeah, and so she had to go get that. She had to go get that done because there's a lady that had a book that you kind of had to match. I don't know. They called it a book lady. They pictures of everything. So if you had to come back and do something, you knew how it was. And because her dress was blown up enough, you were to see her underwear. She couldn't go back and change. She mm -hmm. had to go back and dry herself and yeah, address the wet underwear. Right, yeah. Mm. And uh, so, so while they were doing that, we'd been, this was at Atlanta, so we'd been doing this for three or four weeks maybe. And so when she came back, she walked up towards me. And they bend over, there's a penny on the ground. And she said, Will... What are you doing? She said, I'm picking up a penny. She said, why'd you pick up a penny? I said, it was good luck. She says, you want luck? Let me have that penny. You see all them people there, and there's another dozen behind the camera. She takes that penny and sticks it down in one side of her brassiere. Uh -huh. Takes that penny, sticks it down in that side of her brassiere, and said, there's some good luck. And, you know, so that just cracked everybody <laughs> up. And the name in, in a book that's called The Lucky Penny or something like that. Yeah. I, I still have that penny. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. It's a 42 D. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's very good, good stuff. So if you're listening on the radio, we have a picture. Of, it's Lonnie Anderson in the pit area and uh, Will standing right in front of her. And who are some of the other people in this picture? Um, there's Donnie Hayes the in there. Yeah, the, the gentleman to my left is one of the uh, Wood Brothers boys, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. The guy in the the second uniform to the left, the white one, uh, no, another one to the left, was, uh, I can't think of his name, but he drove the 20 car. He was he was he lost his life in a car wreck. I can't remember his name. And then that's Johnny Hayes with his hand in the appropriate location to blow there between her ankles oh okay uh, down there yes yeah. i see him i've heard chris or steve blackwell talk about him a lot oh and you know what that picture you saw that you thought there was somebody he is in the movie he's sitting he's the second guy to the right from me the white shirt is 7-eleven and then the picture to the right of that is the guy in a mm -hmm. with a, a short guy trucker hat yeah with a white he's a guy he's just a guy that works for me Okay. Uh, that worked for me. It's the one, but that's the guy I'm thinking when you were talking about in the picture of the 7 Eleven car. The one that Don was talking about, Parker Stevenson. I think so. Maybe. Okay. How about but that? That gentleman is in the car picture. I know that. Yeah. All right. Well, that's interesting. So that movie was, uh, that was going into the 80s, right? Early 83. 83, 83. yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's the one, I, the Souvenir Magazine that I should have brought it had that one on. It had Burt Reynolds and Lonnie, Lonnie Anderson on the front cover. Of it, and Tracy said she went to the premiere. I guess the it was the movie premiere. Mm -hmm. You she met did. him, right, Tracy? I did. Yeah, there you go. They the, could have the, taken her away. In at person, that time. they're just <laughs> as funny. You know, they're, they're in my opinion, he doesn't act. He just that's just, the way he is. Exactly. <laughs> he's he's <clears throat> funny. He was a lot of fun to be around. I bet so. So, who was your uh, or your all time? Let's say your all time <laughs> favorite driver you had to pick as a fan as a well fan. i i clearly owe a debt of gratitude to dale senior 
Donnie Allison was the one that I learned the most from. So that was probably who I understood what they were doing mm -hmm. better. I did a, an awful lot of work for Bill Elliott, so I'm I'm proud of what he did for me. Um, I I in hindsight, I'm still very very impressed with Ricky Rudd. <laughs> yeah. We ran 25 races and he never crashed that car. When in doing some research, I couldn't find anything. I have a picture of the right front corner being smashed at Rockingham, hmm. and when I looked up the record, we lost a motor at Rockingham. And it doesn't show that we crashed. So my feeling is it, you know, he spun in the oil or right. hit the wall a little bit. But mm -hmm. he never he never crashed that car. He kept the sunny side up the whole season, best I can tell. Mm -hmm. He still calls me Uncle Bud. Mm -hmm. oh. Another story. Yeah, that's cool. That's good stuff there. And you uh, in this, you wrote two drivers that left me the, with the most respect, Dylan Hart Jr. And it says Kyle Petty. Yeah, th those are the th people that I probably have the most respect for. Um, th those two guys <laughs> walked in their own darn shoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't imagine what that was like for either one of them having to, yeah, to race in the shadow of their father's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. footsteps. I can't imagine. And I mean, I just was, I don't know either one of them well at all, but I'm, Big admirers of both of those gentlemen for that reason. I'm still trying to get Kyle to come up here, but now he's busier than he's ever been because I was his jack man back in the 96. Who was that? Kyle Petty. Oh, really? And then 95, I uh, traveled with him through that whole year. But, yeah, yeah. Um, one I, of these days. But. Well, I, I sent him a copy of this book because there's it's sort of in the backgrounds we've shared a similar life experience, and I just thought he might appreciate Yep. He's a good reading guy. about somebody else's yeah he's a good guy too <laughs> yeah he, oh, sure he sent me an awful nice note i put on facebook he Aww. he was very very nice man we so, follow him on twitter and he's constantly saying nice things on twitter as well yeah we met we met up with him when he was playing up in salisbury so we all went out to dinner and stuff it was like it's kind of like an old sabco reunion um when we met, met up with, about four years ago i guess paul rodriguez says robbie robbie moroso, moroso. yeah was that who it was rob moroso Robbie Moroso in that picture? I don't know. No, sir. I've never no. I've never done anything yeah. with Robbie. Okay. I was thinking you probably would have remembered that. But I did want to ask you, before we went on break, we were talking about Smokey Unit. And I got to meet him one time. And I know you were around him a little bit there. Um, how was Smokey Unit? I, I never worked with Smokey. My conversations with Smokey were as a second lieutenant, if we went down there with Donnie Allison or with mario rossi mario rossi was very good to me as well the, 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 the story that i have about donnie and rossi that it leaves me fond of them both was that we sat on we sat on a pole for the daytona 500 in 75 and that motor was built by bill jenkins and when he he'd come down there and he and donnie were pretty close and it was a it was a pretty trick as a matter of fact the valve train and that motor is what got me started on my book about vehicle dynamics. I, I got really deep into wheel frequencies and harmonics and stuff mm. because of that motor. But the Monday after the Daytona 500, I come into work, working on the car. The motor's been pulled, and Donnie comes in and says, comes out, and he said, went to the engine room, and he came out and said, where's Rossi? And Rossi wasn't there, and Donnie knew where he went. He would he had taken the manifold and the carburetor down to Smokey. And Donnie didn't want that, so he got in and run down to Smokey's and pushed his way past Ralph Johnson. Ralph Johnson's a big old boy. And he went in to push the door open into Humpy's, into uh, Smokey's office, and Mario's showing Smokey this manifold and the carburetor. And Donnie said to Rossi, he said, Rossi, I promised... Jenkins that I wouldn't we wouldn't show that to anybody Smokey had it in his hand and he turned around and he gave it back to Mario Rossi mm, about that out of his respect for Donnie Allison yeah and that I'm impressed with both Donnie and yeah. Smokey for yeah. for that I, I I was impressed with Smokey's flow bench 
I read a lot about him, but I I have no personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was like when I met him that first time. There was the only time I was just pretty much starstruck, and I was <laughs> yeah. just like, "Excuse me, sir, I had to ask uh, Keith Simmons, our engine builder at the time, I had to ask him a question about something I was working on there at, at uh, Dayton, I believe it was." So I was just like, and when he was, when he just kind of looks at me and nods and all, and I don't even remember what he said. I wish I remember what he said, but it was just like, like I said, I was starstruck. Was he smoking a pipe? <laughs> yeah, always. Because he was always time. smoking a pipe. Yeah. He, was, he always would act very smoking philosophical. You he know had a I mean? pretty full life yeah. outside racing too. If you yeah. have read his book, he's pretty big into oil. Yes. Drilling in the Amazon. <laughs> wow. Or someplace. Yeah. 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 Some place with big snakes. He was involved in a lot of stuff. Very smart. Yes. Very, very smart. So, so the other question that we had from Scott Felthausen was, if you hadn't have gotten into racing, what would your real job have been? I, I'm, I'm pretty good at envisioning things in 3D. Mm -hmm. I, after I got out of stock car racing, I got into metal shaping and I wasn't very good at that either, so I thought I, I could design some equipment to maybe make me a better metal shaper. Well, it turns out you, st you still have to know how to shape metal. But, but I, 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 I think I'm a good machine designer. I, I can vision things in 3D, and I, I like organizing and yeah. sorting and filing. And so you'd still be doing I, something I, I can I can draw in 3D. I, that's yeah. sort of a natural. Hmm. As a matter of fact, I drew all the fenders made wooden fender books for a friend of mine in Belfast, Tennessee for building a body for a 1931 or 34 Bugatti Stelvio. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. Made wooden egg crate books. To so John was kind of telling us last week about some of the things you're working on now. Who was? John Callis. Oh. Yeah, because he was in here last week, and we were talking about some of the things, building custom stuff that you've done. So what do you do nowadays? Mow grass. I don't. I'm, yeah, I don't. I, I don't hit much. I mean, really, I about you, yeah. six or seven months ago, I sold my big power shear out of my shop, and I couldn't have done that if I hadn't decided that I was done. Yeah. I built a Humvee. I built a. I built a Model A Speedster. I built an entire aluminum-bodied two-seat Speedster. <laughs> gas welded all the aluminum panels and made the wooden bucks to form the panels and i'm really proud of that a guy bought it and he he went to a car show first time the car had ever been out 258 cars and he got first place with this car how about wow. that and he sent me the trophy i just i just <laughs> thought that was just, that's great oh i just that's awesome. i was yeah. pretty impressed so yeah I, i'm not a car collector i just like building stuff yeah i remember that's one of the things that he was telling us Telling us about hmm. that you've been up to. Do you want to spin the wheel today or no? All right, so we're um, we're we're getting low on time, but we're going to keep talking about the rest of your. All right, so if somebody wants to buy your book, that's what we need to get get out there. I've cool. been popping it up here, and uh, so my friends here, y'all want to go and buy Will Cronkite's book, and the uh, the link is on here. Phil's put it on the in the feed, and it's also in the description below the video so whenever this video you know tomorrow or if you watch it again tonight whatever you can go and read the description and it's they'll click that link on there and go the, and the, buy the there's book. a number of places there's six or eight different places that are selling the book for me now for which i am most appreciative but if they buy a book from the uh website uh, i sign it so if you get one from there it's a, it'll be a signed copy the only, uh yeah. junior junior motorsports sells them in there okay place and those are signed but the other people they're not so okay well good that's uh go over to junior motorsports i had uh danny earnhardt on a little while back and he works over there for junior oh uh, cool yeah all right and so and you can also go to my website dhamim.com and it is also on there and also on your website well thank you yep and so go on there and buy that book and you'll get you'll dive deeper into some of the things that we talked about tonight. You get to see more stories. Yes. 
And uh, but thank you so much for coming up here and joining us. And we're just going to ask you, Phil. Do you have the the thing we ask with the cowbell every week? Oh, before we forget that. We do that for the beer man who used to be part of uh, Sabco when David was worked there. Yeah. And that is your favorite Sterling Marlin story. I know that's a PG sort of rated story here, Will. So yeah. you, you're asking me to relate? <laughs> yeah. PG you got, related? Yeah. Have you got a good Sterling Marlin I, story? I, I didn't spend time with Sterling. Maybe um, Cuckoo. But the thing that I remember that, it, that I was impressed was I think after the second race, that he won at Daytona. He was went by himself, was driving home by himself, and stopped at a little gas station and got two hot dogs, and they made him sick. Mm. Oh, <laughs> you man. Can you imagine driving home by yourself? You just won the Daytona 500, and you're puking hot dogs. Mm. Yes. Oh. Yeah, driving all the way up to... Well, he was yeah, a good, he's Tennessee a good old boy. Columbia or Tennessee. Yeah. yeah. Yes, so. in, in Columbia. Yeah. The gentleman that I did the work for the Bugatti is from Belfast, Tennessee, and that's only 30 miles across the interstate from that. We've been we've been over there. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see Sterling. I'd like to see what he's doing. I guess he's still driving, isn't he? Is he still able to drive? He's, I don't think he's driving anymore. He was last year. He's. I, I know recently he was driving. So. Yeah. Yeah, his, yeah. I admire that gentleman, too. Oh, his, he, yeah. His grandson's been driving some, I believe, yeah. but he got a... He got in a wreck the other day, tore that car all to pieces, but Sterling's okay. grandson? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But he's okay. It's just uh but Sterling's still involved in it, of course. But he's uh, I've seen him recently on Facebook a couple weeks ago. And then I saw an interview with Lee McCall from back whenever Sterling was at Sabco or for Ganassi. Mm -hmm. And uh that was pretty pretty cool to see that. And I was there and, and I'd already left Ganassi, Sabco, and in 2004, I went back to Charlotte. I was working for Robert Yates Racing at the time, and I went down to the infield, and I was sitting in the stands, but I went up and talked to Sterling and Lee McCall before he got in the car, and went on, he went and won the Winston Open, uh, but he had a really, really fast car. Yeah, cool. Yeah. All right, so, Tracy? We're good. Okay. All right, well then. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so any parting words there? How people can get in touch with you if they'd like to? Um, when you're out mowing grass, I mean, leave him alone when he's mowing. But other than that, <laughs> you'll, uh, but you can go. He's on Facebook. Yes, I, I'm under my own name. Uh, no nom de plume. <laughs> Good. It's W. It's Will. Yes, sir, it's Will Cronkite, and it's C R O N K R I T E. And and I tell you one thing that I just would like to ask, just for grins, I've sold my book in six foreign countries, a lot of people in Canada, and forty seven <coughs> states i'd really like to be wow. able to sell a book in alaska wyoming and south dakota if you know anybody wow <laughs> i'd like put i'd the, like to put the feelers out there i'd like to i'd like to be able to say that i've sold a book in every state mm -hmm. there you go yeah sold wyoming. one in england alaska. and sweden france the netherlands england what about australia i don't know australia, australia yes okay. yeah a metal shaper friend of mine yeah, I think I wrote about him in the books. As a matter of fact, because they do some, they do some racing down there. Yes, sir. Of course. Um, I was trying to think if we had any listeners in Wyoming or hmm. South Dakota. Is that South Dakota. South Dakota. Yeah, or Alaska. Well, we've got friends who have friends who have friends. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, yeah. if any of right. y'all listening tonight, yeah. have a friend. So, how many yeah. years total were you a part of NASCAR? About twenty-five. About twenty-five. Good career. Best yeah. of times, best of times. It, it sure. was. I, my book is doing really well. Mm -hmm. I was a peripheral participant. I'm sure everybody that buys that book is not <laughs> after me personally. But what I've figured out is that time frame that I was involved is the most people are most interested yeah. in that time exactly. frame. Yeah, the right. 70s and the exactly. 80s seem to be. What put Even NASCAR, on the, NASCAR on the map? Look, yeah. look yeah. for what was going on. The back people, then, the personalities, so. and stuff. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So, so um, I was going to mention this. Uh, well, say hey to Kit and Paul Rodriguez down at Port St. Lucie, Florida, and uh, they're down there where all the, the history of NASCAR, you know, yes, the organization sir. started, all in that area, a little bit further north of them, but it's still not too far. And um, Kenny Coltsback, he reminds me, and I remember this now. His uh, he's talking about Smoky Unix daughter Trish. Uh, she helps with some of the, their carbon stuff. His grandson shapes surfboards. 
How about that? Well, so we're talking about carbon fiber? No, we're talking about... Kinney, ca um, ca carbon kinney, yes. Carbon kinney gets it from... We're talking about, um, yeah, Trish. Smoky Unit. Mm -hmm. So his kid, his daughter, she's on Twitter. Right. And so yeah, I had her... I've yeah. been interfaced with her kind of regularly did you get one books. of books. Did you get one of the decals that she was sending send out? I think it's hashtag Smoky Forever, best damn garage in town. No, I haven't. I didn't. So, yeah, so whenever you... I'd still have to place mine yet. I'm still waiting to the perfect spot. <laughs> I have a spot picked out, but I'm trying to find all my other ones that I want to put up there too. Um, and so then I'm going to do the tweet and hashtag it. Oh, cool. Yeah. So that's going to be, that's going to be good. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's, it's my pleasure. Uh, David and Tracy and Phil and, and Phil. Philip. There you go. There I've you enjoyed go. your company. I appreciate the invitation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. We've enjoyed it. Yeah, definitely enjoyed it. And uh, maybe you can come back sometime. Maybe bring bring some of your friends. And uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to come back. I've been I, I, talking about racing, about people that know about the time I was involved. It's right. yeah. fun for me. Yep. So I, I, I mean, I just come hang out someplace. I, I enjoyed this. You're, you're, you're very knowledgeable. And Thank you. And that's the thing I'd like to do is get some of the people that I've had on here, get them back with people like, you know, let's say you come in here and, and Ricky Red's in here or um, even John Callis or whatever, just people that you've worked with in the past. Get or, my dad or, in um, here. Yeah, or Mike Hill. I mean, you know. Oh, yeah, Mike. I like Mike. How cool yes. would that be? Because, I mean, gosh, that was how long ago <laughs> you worked together? A long time well, ago. from 1971, probably. Yeah. Wow. So how long is that? Years. That's 50 years. That's 50, 50 years now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that is yes. 50, isn't it? But, but what? Yeah, it <laughs> that is. Old, that old man in the mirror is starting to tick me off. Oh, oh, uh, uh, so uh, what's kind of uh, cool, too, is that a lot of people that are, like Mike Hill listens to the, the radio show in the mornings when I'm in here with me and, and Billy Buck, the owner of the station. So he listens and he'll send me a text every once in a while. And, he had some great Junior Johnson stories. Yes. Um, and so we'll be talking about some racing or whatever, and then he'll he'll send a text. And he's always got the backstory like T.G. Shepard, you know, like one day it was his birthday. And so I was, play, I was let's play a T.G. Shepard song. And he's like, you know how he come up with that? It's it's uh, he has a he had a German Shepherd dog and he said he was looking for a stage name. And he said that German and then Shepherd. So that German Shepherd. Wow, I didn't T. know T. that. T.G. Shepherd. Yeah. yeah. So things you learn from no, having yeah. your friends in NASCAR. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, and we do uh, have one viewer yes. that says he's going to get one from Rhode Island, one of your books. All right. Is that right? Boy, I thought I was. I thought I would never sell a book from Rhode Island. I, I have done that. Yeah. Yes. Because I, I am, are we still? Yes. Yeah, we're on. Um, yeah. The, the fact that the name of the book was I was a NASCAR redneck, yeah. I have heard some people n not be favorable to the term yes. redneck. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I'm thinking if... People in Rhode Island are n not going to be too enthused about rednecks, and I can't imagine there are many NASCAR <laughs> fans in Rhode Island. I just thought that was never, uh -huh. never going to. Yeah. Well, there's only 26 Understand. people in the state, right? Well, well, <laughs> yeah. When you look at it on the map, one of the things I do on fa on Facebook is I've got a map that I post when mm -hmm. I when I needed like 10 or 12 books, and each time I sell one in those areas, I yes. color it in, you know. Yes. And, right. Oh, I was so proud to yeah. put that little dot of just like Rhode the Island RV in there. Stickers on the back of people's yes, ma'am. That's exactly what yeah. it looks like. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's good stuff. So there was, um, all right. So there was one more. Well, uh, Jim Dilly says, "How about I have a fundraiser for all the old racers and fans at the Civic Center, which is right down here." That's a great idea. And um, Suzette McGuire's out in California, so maybe she'll buy a book. Have you sold? I guess you've sold in California, probably. But maybe well, I'm, I'm not adverse to selling more. Yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and I also want to thank Great RV Life once again. If you want to rent an RV to go uh, to one of the racetracks, we've got Charlotte coming up. We've got Martinsville. Any of these, you can take it, or just want to get a vacation and get away, right? Well, That's Martinsville right, would be yeah. a great place to go see in an RV. Mm -hmm. You can park up close on that back stretch. Yeah. That'd be a great place to take an RV. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it sure would. Well, That's the nice sure. thing about that is if you came in town from out of town and you rented from this company you could just drive it to these local tracks you wouldn't have to put all the mileage out there that's interesting i'll be taking mine to watkins Glen. leaving out this thursday i'll be up at watkins Glen for the next week so oh that'd be fun you just need to come on up david we'll do a I show know. i was thinking that too <laughs> we certainly could do that yeah come on up buddy i got yeah. i got the cats in me so that's what i want to do i want to start being able to just take take the show on the road at some point you know yeah oh cool start doing that yeah, yeah cool all right where you could smell gasoline and burnt rubber that's there it you go. Yeah. exactly all right, thanks everybody for tuning in. We had Will Cronkright with us this evening. 
And uh, make sure you check out my website, dhamim.com, and then you can find his book, and the links to his book is on here, and it's, and it's also on my website. But y'all have a uh, great rest of your evening, and tune into the Billy Buck Morning Show tomorrow morning with a side of ham. And I will be sitting right here at 6 a.m., and we will see y'all tomorrow morning. And uh, we'll see you next Monday. I don't really have anybody scheduled yet, but the following way I have Marty Houston. So the son of Tommy Houston, the brother of the oh, older cool. brother of Andy. Oh, cool. Yeah, but I had Tommy in here and Andy at the same time. So I'm going to get Andy back in with his son at some point. So maybe I'll see if Andy can come in next Monday. I just got to find somebody. But I'll definitely do that. We'll find somebody, right? Well, That's we right. want to thank yes. Billy Buck for letting us use the studio as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. So mm-hmm. maybe he's... What, what's the in. name of that show? That's, it's Billy Buck. It's the morning show. Billy Buck morning show. Billy Buck. Oh, Buck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel better about that. <laughs> well, he owns a station, and he was, the, he was down in Charlotte for a while, though, so you may remember him from... The, he was with WFMX 105.7. They played the qualifying tour. They were one of the last to, in the area to be playing... Still play the qualifying for NASCAR. Yeah, yeah cool. Because I used to listen to it all the time myself. Cool. All right. Well, y'all have a great night, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Welcome to Racing Roots with Ham. If you don't know our host, David Ham, he's a 25-year NASCAR veteran, engine builder, and jackman. Live every Monday evening, we have a new guest. From the racing world with their stories, their paths, their, their racing, racing roots. roots. Sponsored by Jersey Cape Yachts. Country 550 and 92.9 WAME and W225BD Statesville.